Today we're looking at part seven of Bitter Waters and Sweet, Naomi and the Desert. You may have picked up why we gave it that title as we read through, because they came to Mara, they couldn't drink of the waters of Mara, that's in the desert. They called it Mara because the waters were bitter. And if you remember the opening chapter of the book of Ruth, uh, we find Naomi speaking in Naomi uh, from Naama, which means pleasant. Uh, she said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. She had tasted of the bitter waters when she went to Moab, where her husband Elimelech and her two sons, Mahon and Kilion, both died. And she's coming back to Bethlehem and the people say, ah, is this Naomi? We haven't seen her for more than 10 years. She says, call me not Naomi, call me Mara. And here the children of Israel are going through the Mara experience in Exodus 15. And God is testing them to see whether or not they will walk by faith or whether they will become bitter and rebel and disobey him. How delighted we are that Naomi, though she had her Mara experience, chose not to rebel. And God gave her a daughter-in-law, though a Moabitess, and under a great curse of God from many centuries before, a descendant of Moab, the illegitimate son of Lot and one of his daughters after he fled Sodom. That God brought that woman, Ruth, into the messianic line. We have grace. We have law. Israel has received the law. Israel comes to Mara. Israel rebels. You have received grace. You will come at some point in your life to the waters of Mara. The question is, will you receive the grace of God or will you rebel? Exodus 15. Now it's been a while since we've been here in Exodus. Four weeks ago, October 8th, we saw part six of that, but then three weeks ago, my son Isaiah and his beautiful bride, Melissa, got married down in Florida, and so Elder Keith McCoy brought a message that Sunday morning, though I managed to get in for the last part of it and hid out in the stairwell, as you know, in the back. <laughs> and uh, we had some very interesting experiences. Some of the folks there who helped with our sound system, one said to the other, I think there's somebody hiding out in the back. And, so one went up one stairwell and the other one went up the other stairwell and they found me <laughs> sitting there. But I heard the last part of Keith's message, good message, and likewise in the evening. But then uh, two weeks ago, October 22nd, was Fall Mission Sunday, and we had Alex Weir and Reverend Keith Coleman, great messages related to missions. What a tremendous blessing it is to be involved in world missions and to reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here are men and women and their families, children, some of whom have grown up on the mission field. And then second generations going back to share the good news of Christ with those who have never heard. And then last week we had Reformation Sunday and I preached on Reformation or Revolution. And of course there were many different texts that we looked at out of the Old Testament where we saw that God's people tend to get lazy and slothful after they've been in fellowship with God, but things, time goes by, things are good, things are easy, and they fall into apostasy, and then they have evil leaders raised up, and persecution sets in, and reformation has to take place. And we saw that throughout the history of, not merely Old Testament Israel, but we saw that throughout the history of the church with the martyrdom of saints all over the world and particularly by the harlot Rome which pretends to be the church but kept the word of God away from the people and God as he did in the Old Testament raised up his prophets his servants the prophets that phrase comes many many times in the Old Testament my servants the prophets my servants the prophets my servants the prophets rise up over and over and over God sent the prophets and they killed them and they stoned them and they drove them out 
But then he sent his son, and they killed him, but he rose from the dead. We find different points of revival during the history of Israel. Just as we saw with the church, God raised up different reformers and the Catholic organization murdered many of them, but then he raised up Martin Luther. And 500 years ago last Sunday, or last Tuesday actually, just five days ago, the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, and we are children of the Reformation. Praise God for that. We now have the Word of God in our own language. And all over the world, the Word of God has been translated into thousands of languages, though there are yet thousands to go. It's the Word of God which is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It's the Word of God that pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And we have it in our own language, not dead Latin. And so now today we're back to bitter waters and sweet, Naomi and the desert. Now in our text up to now, we have been discussing what God does when people rebel against his ordained leadership. What does God do when people rebel against the leadership which God himself has ordained? Very quickly in review, we've tried to answer this question. Why is rebellion against God's ordained leadership counted as rebellion against God himself. And we saw that there are at least four reasons why. Number one, because God always provides leadership in every sphere of authority which he has ordained. And the spheres of authority which he has ordained are the family, the church, government, and work. Those are the four spheres, you big, think of a big, huge, round circle and inside it all the things that relate to family and another one which all the things that are inside it relate to the church and another one all the things inside it relate to government and another one everything inside it which relates to work and employment and as in a, what's called a Venn diagram there is some interaction between these where they overlap one with another so someone who has authority in one sphere may also have authority in another sphere. But you need to make sure that those areas of the sphere which have no authority do not encroach into another sphere where God has a distinctly ordained and authorized authority. And so we saw that God ordains those four categories. We talked about the home. We talked about the dual level authority, the children and wives under the father, but the children have to obey both mother and father. We looked at that in Ephesians 6, Colossians 3, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3. We talked about the church, where leadership in the church, which includes the pastor, the elders, the deacons, is to be obeyed. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and verse 17. And we saw that the Bible puts the pastor in parallel with the role of a father he compares him to ruling a household and children where obedience is required we saw that over in first timothy 3 verses 4 and 5 one that ruleth well his own house having his children in subjection with all gravity for if a man know not how to rule his own house how shall he take care of the church of god very clear parallel we talked about how pastors also have the authority to stop troublemakers to stop critics and false teachers that authority is also extended to biblically qualified and biblically appointed lead elders in the absence of a pastor. We saw that in Titus chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. Then we looked at the sphere of authority of government. That's Romans 13, verses 1 through 8. And obedience here is also an absolute command unless the government requires you to either disobey a command or a prohibition given by God who is the higher authority. It's not a matter of being rebellious against government when you're obeying God. Because there you're obeying the higher authority. Just like if you're a private first class in the, in the army and the general gives you one command and the sergeant gives you a different command, you're not rebelling against the sergeant when you obey the general, even if their commands are different. The issue is always obedience to the highest authority. But make sure you've got it clear what the highest authority has said on the issue whereby you want to do different than the intermediate authority commands you to do. And we saw that in Romans chapter 13. Then we talked about work. 
That's also an absolute command unless the boss requires you to violate a command or a prohibition required by God. And I gave you an illustration of a relative of mine who was told to lie by her boss. She refused to lie and she was fired. But otherwise, servants are to be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of heart as unto Christ. That's the qualifier. That's Ephesians chapter 6. We see the same thing in Colossians chapter 3. The second reason why rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God is because God forbids rebellion to divine ordained authority. Now that's an obvious corollary to reason number one, that God ordained the intermediate authority, but it's distinct from it because the Bible commands that intermediate authority, that is divinely appointed leaders in the home, church, government, and work, he commands that they must be obeyed unless the leadership gives commands or prohibitions that are in contradiction to the Bible. When you rebel against divinely qualified and appointed authority, you are directly disobeying a command of the Bible. The third reason we saw why rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God is this. Rebellion against authority is an accusation against God. You're telling God that he's either stupid or didn't know what he was doing, or you're telling God he didn't really understand what was best when he qualified and placed leadership and authority. Number four, the fourth reason why rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God is this, rebellion against authority, and this is one that permeates many churches. Rebellion against divinely ordained and qualified authority is an attempt to establish your own personal authority, which stems from pride. And we saw how horribly dangerous that is. It's even life-threatening, as Israel discovered, because pride is the sin of the devil when he rejected God's authority and decided to pit his own will against the will of Almighty God. And we studied that out of Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. Then we moved out of what I've called rebellion theory and made application, and you know how it works. People are always asking, what's the minimum I must do and still be in compliance with the letter of the law? Always looking for loopholes, always looking for more pleasing options because we don't happen to like what it, we're being told to do right at the moment. And uh, we gave the illustration, of course, from the life of Christ when the lawyer challenged him regarding eternal life and Jesus responded with a parable of the Good Samaritan. The lawyer wanted to limit the pool of people to whom he was responsible, to limit the pool of beneficiaries. Who are the ones that I really absolutely have to do something good for them? And so Jesus gave the parable of the Good Samaritan to answer the question, who is my neighbor? Jesus expanded the pool. He didn't limit the pool to include people the lawyer despised and hated, the Samaritans. Now, the last time we were in Exodus, number part six, that brought us to the study of the rebellion of the children of Israel in relation to an application and biblical response. So the question concerning what is my specific obligation or I don't want to have to do more than I have to has an even deeper level of analysis to make sure that we personally are not in rebellion. And here it goes to the question of what about the case of multiple leaders? When God has ordained multiple leaders in a particular group, one of his spheres of authority. You know, and we talked about the illustration of kids who automatically side with mom because she spends more time with them. And when mom wants something, she gets the kids on her side and so they put pressure on dad, that kind of thing. So the question is, what if there are multiple leaders in one of the divinely ordained spheres of authority? And we saw that people who ask that question usually have a situation where they have one leader they don't like and would rather support a different leader. So what about multiple leaders? You know the Bible answers that question clearly. Because more precisely, what if there are multiple leaders and what if there's disagreement among the leaders? Who do you follow? The answer is that God always, not some of the time, but God always ordains one of the leaders as the final authority. He always appoints one as the principal leader. We gave you the illustration of the family. We talked about the wife who has intermediate authority over the children. She is supposed to be, biblically speaking, subordinate to her husband who has the final authority in family matters. Remember, there are some overlaps in the spheres of authority in that Venn diagram that I drew out for you in the air here. 
But many wives don't get it. They whine, pout, rebel, fuss, scheme, manipulate to get their own way. And we listed a few of the forms that manipulation takes. I won't go over all of them, but you know some of them. A deliberate squandering of money the husband's worked hard for so that he can't spend it, she'll spend it for him. Pretending to have health issues that make herself the center of attention. Throwing physical assets away the wife knows the husband wants to keep. Screaming and yelling and trying to manipulate him by brute force. Throwing things at I've dealt with all of these in counseling situations, by the way. Throwing things at him when, and telling him uh, that you'll call the police if he tries to physically stop you. Giving him the silent treatment. Withholding sex. Gossiping to other people, not just the children, to get them on her side. Encouraging rebellion. And by the way, that happens in churches, too. Where gossip, 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 gossip. We have some gossip chains in this church. Gossip, 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 gossip. And, you know, without leadership knowing, this little thing is spreading around the church. And... People are trying to, you know, jockey for position to get people on their side. We're going to see some illustrations about that from the Bible today. And God helps those people. That's serious business. That's not petty sin. We'll see that in a minute. Encouraging rebellion in others, but sitting by while acting sweet. A lot of other creative forms of rebellion as well. The list goes on, and you know I speak the truth because you've done it. God will judge you for it. Understand that clearly. Get your act together now. Okay, so what about the other three spheres of authority? Let's look at some examples uh, in the Bible. In a different realm of authority, we find the illustration in the life of Moses when Miriam, Moses' older sister, and Aaron, Moses' older brother, they're both older than he is. But God put him in number one position. But they decide to co-opt and preempt Moses' leadership. And they had five good reasons for doing it. Number one, Moses had done something they thought was stupid and culturally unacceptable. He had married the Ethiopian woman and they weren't very happy about that. They thought that was stupid. They thought that was culturally unacceptable. Number two, and here's a great reason, they outnumbered him. Number three, he was kid brother. They were older than he was. Number four. Oh, here's the pious reason. They had been around serving the Lord longer than he had. While they'd been busy serving the Lord in Egypt under that oppression and stuff, and he was just out there wandering around in the desert. He was living in Pharaoh's house. And that's the fifth reason. Listen, Moses, while you're living in the luxury of Pharaoh's palace for 40 years, and while you're fooling around in the desert for 40 years, we're suffering under the oppression of Pharaoh. After all, fair is fair. And we ought to have had some say in the matter as well as our kid brother. Now, humanly, those are all great reasons, aren't they? They're reasons that all of us have used at one time or another. Of course, they're full of logical fallacy because they omit the key premises. That's also stupid reasoning. It misses the point entirely. Because the real issue is, number one, who ordained the multiple levels of authority? And it was God. <laughs> hey, you want to argue with God? He's been around a lot longer than you have. He's been a lot more holy than you have. He's the older brother, if you want to put it that way. He's the one who has put up with a lot more than you've ever thought about putting up with. Number two, who has the ultimate authority placed in the pool of intermediate authorities? Got a whole pool of intermediate authorities here. But God chooses one to be, though he's still an intermediate authority between God and those under, but God says that's the one who's going to be the leader. This church has gone through some of that kind of rebellion of a man who was placed in authority here in this church. And the elders decided they were going to get rid of him. Serious business. This church is suffering today because of that. You know all it. You all know about it. At least those of you who are old and have been here for a while. Moses and his siblings. That was Numbers 12, verses 1 through 16. Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he'd married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Just remember, every time you open your mouth, every time you start a rebellion, God hears it. And he will fry you. Because God does not tolerate rebellion. You'll pay for it. I guarantee you. God is long-suffering, but you will pay for it if you do not repent. 
So that brings us to today. That instant dealt with two individuals. But this issue of rebellion gets a lot more complex, especially when you're dealing with groups of leaders. Let me give you another example that is even more serious, which is the example of Korah and company. Here's a group of subordinate leaders in two different classes, a religious class and a secular political class. But they had joined together. They had decided they're going to overthrow the leadership of Moses. Now, hey, he did, he did okay when he was dealing with his brother and his sister, but now what's he going to do with us? Big group of Levites, 250 of them. Big group of political leaders. The heads were two, but they had many followers. And they said, let's join forces. We'll get rid of Moses and we'll do our own thing. Korah and company, a group of subordinate leaders who were killed for their rebellion to God's principal intermediate authority, a group of rebellious leaders who impacted the entire nation. And do you know that when there's a group of rebellious intermediate leaders in a church, it impacts the entire church? When there's a group of intermediate leaders in government, it impacts the entire society? When there's a group of leaders in inter uh, intermediate leaders in rebellion, in workforce, it impacts the entire workplace and may impact the economy for a nation. You know about it. Called unions. We're in Numbers chapter 16. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi. So Korah is a Levite. Levi was the tribe that was chosen to be priests. The Levitical priesthood, there's a huge amount of material all over the Old Testament about the Levitical priesthood. So Korah is a Levite. And then it talks about two other guys, Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliav and On, the son of Peleth. Ah, they weren't Levites, it says sons of Reuben. They were Reubenites. Now remember that's very interesting because ultimately when we come into the promised land, they're nowhere near it at this point, but when we come into the promised land, uh, Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh are going to get assigned some territory that is across the Jordan River. They're going to build an altar. There's some interesting things that go on. That's down in the text later on. But these guys are Reubenites. So we've got two different groups of rebels. Rebellious rebels are the religious rebels, the 250 Levites who are associated with Korah, and we'll see there are 250 of them later on in the text and secular political rebels from the tribe of Reuben. And notice they respond differently in the text. They do different things, but both are considered rebellion, and they both get nailed. The religious rebels attempt to do a religious servants service in disobedience to what God has assigned. They say, we're going to get on the act too. So we're going to find out that the ones who are the followers of Korah, the ones who are the Levites, are going to go in with censers into the tabernacle to offer incense before God and to do some things that God said only the Aaronic priesthood could do. But they say, we're Levites. Aaron's a Levite. Moses is a Levite. Why can't we do the same thing that Aaron and Moses? They're, they're just Levites just like we are. Moses and Aaron were both Levites, but Aaron was the one God chose to head the Aaronic priesthood, and Moses was the one that God chose to head the nation. The secular rebels were a little bit different. They refused to obey the secular authority appointed by God. Moses was the secular authority appointed by God, and God, through Moses, said to Dathan and Abiram, you guys come here, we're going to talk. And they said, we're not going to come up and talk to you. We don't have to come if we don't want to. We'll sit here in our tents. We're not going to do anything. See if you can make us do it. So one group wanted to participate more than they were required to or allowed to. The other group said, we're not going to participate at all. We're going to stonewall you, and you can just go chew on a rock. We don't care. Two different approaches. Both the spirit of rebellion. In both cases, the rebels received the divine death penalty. Now, so we get to verse 2. That was just verse 1. We're in number 16. 
Number 16, 2. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. These are not some kind of, you know, disgruntled little, you know, homeless guys sitting out on the street drinking their wine out of the bottles that have been thrown out of the back of a restaurant and they're trying to drain out the last few drips. I've dealt with people like that. That's not the people that we have here. These are the famous guys. These are guys who made a name for themselves. These are the guys who for years have been politically maneuvering and positioning themselves and struggling and getting allies on their side and putting this thing together so that when they decide to make their move, it's going to be a big move and Moses better pay attention. That happens in churches. It happens in every church because it's a tactic that Satan has used over and over and over and over again in attacking the people of God and in attacking divine leadership. And if you don't know it's coming, it'll blindside you and you don't, won't know what happened. Beware when someone comes up to you and says, by the way, I've just got a prayer request. Have you heard? Say, now wait a minute. Am I part of the problem? No. Uh, am I part of the solution? No, but you can pray about it. And I don't want to hear it. I had a number of years ago, this was back in 1970, let's see, 76. 1976. I had just become the pastor of Mountain View Gospel Church up in Wayne, New Jersey. And um, I understood that a former pastor had been involved in a past adultery which had gotten him kicked out of that church. And then he'd gone to another church where he got involved in adultery again even though they knew about the problem. I got a phone call one day. It said, Mountain View Gospel Church, this is Pastor Spencer. How may I help you? The voice on the other end said, have you heard what just went on with pastor, and I won't tell you his name, but pastor so-and-so? I said, who is this, please? They said, it's not important. I said, then it's not important that I talk to you, and I hung up on him. There are always people out there trying to agitate the waters, always people trying to get you to lean a little closer to where the sharks can get you. When people begin to pry into personal things, ask them the question, am I part of the problem? If they say yes, then say, well, the people with whom I have the problem should be the ones talking to me, not you. If you say, am I part of the solution? They'll say yes, say to them, wait, before you tell me any more, if I'm part of the solution, tell me in what way am I part of the solution? Am I part of the leadership of this church? Has this been brought to the pastor and the elders yet? If they say no, say, then I'm not part of the solution. What you need to do is you need to go to talk to the pastor and the elders. Keep out of the gossip ring. It will kill the church. What we've got is something very similar to that here. Here's what they said. They finally have got their group together. They've built their pack. The wolves have surrounded Moses and Aaron. They think they got them now. They haven't been paying attention with the plagues in Egypt where they saw the mighty hand of God at work. They weren't paying attention when they were by the Red Sea and the Shekinah glory stood between Israel and the camp of the Egyptians all night and it gave light to one and darkness to the other all night long. They weren't paying attention when Moses lifted his rod over the sea and God parted the sea. And they walked through on dry land in water that was 600 feet deep on both sides of them. They weren't paying attention to the fact that the Shekinah glory was a wall between them and the Egyptians who were following them into the sea with their horses and chariots. They weren't paying attention when God looked out of the cloud and he took off the chariot wheels and there were at least 600 chariots minimum. We talked about how many there might have actually been if they were called his whole army together, not just his personal entourage, which was 600 chariots. That's 1,200 chariot wheels if he only got two-wheel two chariots. And he says, God knocked all the wheels off together. And the Egyptians said, we better flee. You know, God's fighting for the, for the Israelites. They weren't paying attention. 
Because they were in that group that was running away. They're the group that got over to the other side and the next day they saw Pharaoh's army washed up dead on the shore. They weren't paying attention. We are dealing with the true and living God. These guys weren't paying attention. They had been there. They'd done that. They'd seen that. They'd seen the miracles of God. And now they decide, okay, we're going to take over. Abject stupidity. And so were those who were in rebellion in this church. Abject stupidity, and they will receive the judgment, and some of them have already, they are dead, will receive the judgment of God. Look at verse 3. They gathered themselves together against Moses and Aaron. This didn't just sort of happen. They were all sort of in a meeting. And they said, well, you know, why don't we ask some questions? They said to them, here's this group talking to Moses and Aaron. Now, they start with a false premise. Ye take too much upon you. Now, wait a minute. Let's go back for a moment. Did Moses and Aaron take this upon themselves? Or do I recall some kind of a story where Moses was uh, in the wilderness, I think it was Exodus chapter 3, and, and he saw a burning bush. And um, he thought, man, this is really strange. That bush burns, but, it, but it's not burned up. And he approaches the bush, and God speaks to him out of the bush. Moses, take off your shoes for the ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. And Moses falls on his face. Do I recall a story where, where God was saying to Moses, um, you're going to go back to Egypt. Did Moses just sort of decide he's going to saunter back to Egypt and see if he can make a deal out of this thing? He didn't want to go. You're going to go back to Egypt. And you are going to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses didn't have much choice in that. Did God call him and appoint him and anoint him and empower him and give him the courage for he was a weak kneed mealy mouth who stuttered because I, I stutter and God said to Moses Moses who made your mouth but God said to Moses look because you're a chicken I'm going to give you Aaron your brother and he can talk for you but you're going to be the one that carries the message their first premise is a false premise and often when there are those who are raising rebellion they will start with a false premise be warned just look out for the premises this is basic logic some of you have taken logic in school I hope you have I took it in college, and I mean, boy, it sure has stood by me in many, many situations. False premise they start with, you take too much upon you. They didn't take it upon them. God appointed them. Seeing all the congregation are holy. Now, there's a true premise that's misapplied. All the congregation was holy. All the congregation had been set apart at the Red Sea. The whole congregation came across, God killed the Egyptians, and God established Israel as a nation from that point forward. All the congregation was set apart. That's what the word holy means. All the congregation was. So there's a true pr premise, but it's mixed, misapplied because it is mixed with the false premise. Seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them. That's true. And here's another true premise. And the Lord is among them. That's a true premise. Where was the tabernacle? Where was the Shekinah glory of God? Tabernacle was in the center, and you got uh, three tribes on one side, three tribes on the other side, three tribes on the other side, three tribes on the other side, surrounding the tabernacle in the center, 
And in the tabernacle you have the holy place and you've got the holy of holies and over the holy of holies which was where the ark of the covenant was the Shekinah glory of God the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud rested on the tent. So that's the true premise. Yeah. The Lord is among them. But then they get back to their false premise. Start with the false premise, end with the false premise. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves. There's the false premise they started with above the congregation of the Lord. Now that's the way rebels always reason. That's the way the devil always acts too. He always throws in a bunch of things that are true, but then he throws in a few lies here and there which completely misapply the truth. In other words, since A is true, that is we're all holy, therefore B is true, we have equal authority. Whoa, got some problems there. Therefore, C is not true. If you admit to B that we have equal authority, therefore C is not true. In other words, you don't have final authority. That's typical reasoning of subordinate authorities when there's a power struggle with intermediate authority that God has appointed and somebody else wants somebody different. Verse 4, we're out of time, but I'll go ahead and read the rest of this section. When Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. He didn't take matters into his own hands. He didn't go out and say, okay, guys, come out here. You choose a, a guy who will fight for you, and I'll choose a guy who will fight for me, and let's see who wins. Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his, and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him, even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. He answers the false premise. You don't have to worry about the true premises. He said, I understand where you're coming from, and I understand where you're trying to get to. Let's deal with the false premise, which is the first part, you take too much upon you, and then that last part, you lift up yourselves. Let's deal with that. We'll go up the ladder. We'll talk to the one above us. This past week, I took 12 hours of continuing legal education to keep my law license. And part of it was dealing with, what if you're the general counsel in an organization where you see somebody in the organization, in this case, they were talking about the presidency, and they talked about different things that different presidents have done throughout uh, United States history, which they should not have done, where they overstepped their authority. How do you go up the ladder? How do you take it to highest authority so that you get the right definitive answer and the people are put in the proper place for where they should be? It's a legal premise. It's something that is founded in the scripture. He will show whom he hath chosen and him will he cause to come near unto him. God made the choice. We didn't set ourselves up. We're not here by whim. We're not here just because we bullied somebody else. We're here because God has chosen us. Well, anyway, we're going to have to stop there. Boy, I tell you, this is an exciting passage. If you have time, sometime this week, read Numbers chapter 16 and see what happens to those who are in rebellion. See how they try to manipulate. See the arguments that they make. See the answers that God gives. And the Lord willing, we'll pick it up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word, for its truth, and we thank you that it applies. You have laid out principles in the Old Testament for us in the church. We're not Old Testament, we're New Testament. But you specifically have told us two or three times in the New Testament that these things were written for our examples, that we should not sin according to the same sins that these people committed. And you've given it to us in real living human illustrations and showed us what you did when people broke the rules, when they violated your standards, when they rebelled against the authorities that you had appointed, when they decided to teach a different theology or a different way of life, and what you did about it. And though you're long-suffering, as you have been with Israel in the Old Testament and with the church in the New Testament, sending time after time prophets in the Old Testament, sending time after time in the New Testament reformers to reform the church. And there still is the harlot of Babylon, but someday, and your word promises it, 
In Revelation 17 and 18, you will judge the great whore that sits upon the waters. And the smoke of her burning shall ascend forever. Father, we pray for your blessings upon your word as it's gone forth this day, that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and it will prosper in the thing whereto you sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.